Hello, my name is Mike Daly. I'm the current president of the Geological Society. And I'm here today to go uh, and look at some maps in the spirit of the mapping conference that we're, uh, that we're holding. The plan then is to go and have a look at the map room. And then we've chosen two old and very famous maps that we'll have a look at. And then some other maps from Africa that uh, I was a bit involved with myself. So, let's go and see the map line. So this is the map room. It's a working room. It's full of treasures. Let's go and look behind the scenes. The map room is available to members of the society and our corporate patrons. It is a unique resource. The collections date back to 1807. However, Although we have many historical maps, the bulk of the collection is 20th and 21st century. Today, we hold approximately 40,000 map sheets and about 4,000 of those are digitized. Prior to the pandemic, we were retrieving and reshelving about 10% of the entire collection each year. The UK is the most popular focus, but then Eurasia and Africa are the two continents that get the most inquiries. Individuals come into and out of fashion on a fairly regular basis. We allow users to borrow the maps, take them away, uh, and we also offer confidential advice on maps worldwide, including online references and other possible sources. In the future, we are seeking to digitize the entire collection, but it is tough, mostly because of the uncertain copyright issues that present a significant legal problem. So now, let's go next door and have a look at some maps in detail. So, this is the first map we're going to look at. It's an absolutely splendid map of the Soviet Union, the USSR in the mid-50s. It's called the Tectonic Map of the USSR and Neighboring Countries. And it's dated 1956. Um, and this map was donated to the Geological Society, so it's got a real piece of history about it. And it was donated in 57, uh, which was a year named as International Geophysical Year. And we believe that the delegation who brought the map were the first scientific, or certainly geological delegation, that had left the Soviet Union since the early 20s, the end of the revolution. There's a picture here of the people involved. From left to right, Mr. Arthur Grieg, A.J. Butler, the secretary, Dr. Gilbert Wilson, Vladimir Vusov himself, and Nikolai Shatsky, and seated the president of the society, Leonard Hawkes. So the event was spectacular, uh, and the presentation of this, at the time, absolutely unique map was also pretty spectacular, I'm sure. It's authored by Nikolai Shatsky and Vladimir Belusov, names that many of you will have come across in tectonics and geophysics. And it covers the whole of the USSR and, as it says, neighboring countries. And that's about 9,000 kilometers from the western border with Europe and the Pacific Ocean uh, border over there in the, the Sea of Okhotsk and Kamchatka. 9,000 kilometers across. But north to south, 2,500 to 4,000 kilometers, and in total over 22 million square kilometers of territory in this one map. Uh, that is a lot of footwork and a fantastic achievement. And as well as defining the various tectonic and basinal units of the, the, the Soviet Union, underlying it is a great deal of detail that supports the ideas of Belusov about vertical tectonics and the geodynamics of the, uh, the world or the lithosphere as, as he saw them. And on the map, he marks various, lots of sort of form lines, but within those are other form lines that he describes as gorizonts. And gorizonts were biostratigraphically equivalent units of stratigraphy. So chronostratigraphy, he, 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 they thought in a chronostratigraphic uh, way. And he used the orientation and history of these horizons to work out that 
all the motions of this huge map could be explained by vertical tectonics. He didn't like this idea of large horizontal thrusts that Alpine geologists and Northwest Scotland geologists were propagating uh, in the first half of the last century. In spite of Belousov's very singular view of things, the map itself, whether you believe that or not, you believe Belousov or not, the map itself lives on. And everything that I know about Russian geology, I can sort of see in this map. And I've spent some time looking at Russia and visiting there. You know, we have the Black Sea, we have the Volga Ural Basin, the Urals, Novaya Zemla up there in the, in the Arctic where we were exploring for, for oil and gas, the Caspian and Pre-Caspian Basin, uh, and then this fantastic grey blob here, which is the West Siberian Basin, which is the heart of Russian oil land. The Siberian Kraton and the Tunguska Traps, marked here in uh, the green stippling, and this beautiful curving fold belt here, the Verkhoyansk. And of course, all this chaos down here where the Himalayan and Alpine uh, belts over there start to, to meet this Kraton, Kratonic area of Asia. And in the far east of Russia then, this active margin of accretion, which is basically the Western Pacific margin, Kamchatka, uh, the Sea of Akots, and Sakhalin. This is an awesome map. In the Soviet Union, the belief in dominantly vertical tectonics uh, was a dogma for decades and still has its believers. As chief geologist in BP, I spent a lot of time in Russia, um, particularly in the 2000s, and uh, I recall the beginning of a long dinner with a senior academician in Tumen. And Tumen is sort of here in the central southern part of the West Siberian Basin, this great big grey basin there, Cratonic Basin. And uh, he was determined to instruct me in the flaws of this Western idea of plate tectonics and convince me about vertical tectonics. Sort of superiority of vodka over whiskey was also part of his, uh, his intent. Um, I don't know if I was convinced by the end of the evening but I do know I left with a, a respect for people who work in the middle of continents having a completely different view to geology and the way it evolves as people who work on the margins of continents. And if you compare life in Siberia with life and rocks in Provence and Western, the Western Alps, then it's not surprising there are some uh, differences in opinion how things happen. However, if you go far enough uh, east <laughs> in Russia, there is one very beautiful thrust belt, the Verkhoyansk here, uh, that, uh, that is, for all intents and purposes, a conventional fold and thrust belt, driven by horizontal tectonics. Another interesting aspect of this, this map and this gift to the society was that uh, this was September 1957. It was given on the 4th of October 1957. The Sputnik satellite was launched. And that circled the Earth three months, and for the first three weeks of that time, gave off a beep, beep, beep signal that drove the Western world mad, and particularly the US. Uh, and that was, in many ways, the start of the, the, start of the space race. Um, Within five years of that moment, the whole of this map was being redone through satellites. And a whole new data set of information was plastered on what uh, Belousov and Shatsky had done. But fundamentally, their work stood up to that completely new look. Uh, and I think that's a, an awesome accolade to the work they did. At the same time all this was going on, there were some other workers in the North Atlantic. And they came up with an equally special map, uh, which I'd like to just look at briefly now. So here we have a very different map. This is the North Atlantic Ocean, and it's a physiographic di diagram, describes itself, of the, as the Atlantic Ocean. This is only sheet one. There is, a, there is a southern sheet as well that does the whole Atlantic. And it was put together by 
Hazen and Thrapp, Bruce Hazen and Marie Thrapp. Bruce Hazen was a geophysicist who went to sea a lot in a yacht called the Vima, and Marie Thrapp was the cartographer. It is the beginning of much of the Atlantic geology that many of us know very well these days. Seamounts, big shelf shelves and shelf canyons. But the thing the map is absolutely the first sort of moment of realization of is here we have the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. And in the middle of that ridge, if you look carefully, you will see there is a rift valley. And that rift valley tracking the whole way down the middle of the Atlantic along the Mid-Atlantic Ridge became one of the really big components of people starting to understand seafloor spreading and plate tectonics and all that in the coming decade or so that it took to put it all together. Um, Maria Thropp was little recognized for her work and yet she was the person that brought it to life and she did this beautiful, uh, this beautiful imagery that we can still and we have copies of today and still, still use today. She was, however, recognized later in life uh, by the Library of Congress in the US as the four, one of the four top cartographers of the 20th century. Now, uh, we look at that and we see the great work of Shatsky and Belusov, and they are both stunning pieces of mapping. Uh, Belusov and Shatsky did the largest country, USSR at the time, still, and these guys looked at this huge area of the, of the ocean, the whole of the Atlantic Ocean. Very different techniques, very different conclusions. One pushing the idea of vertical tectonics inside continents, the other clearly opening the door to uh, horizontally driven tectonics in, uh, in, the, in the oceans. Pretty special times, I think. What I'd like to do now is have a look at what was happening in Africa at the same time and go from there to some things that happened in Africa a little later uh, and, uh, and show you some of that. In the aftermath of the Second World War, very similar to the USSR, a post-war resource hunt was going on in Britain. And the Geological Society and the Institute of Mining and Metallurgy got together. And they proposed that there should be a colonial geological survey to look at all the international properties that somehow related to the UK. Uh, a record of that meeting exists. It was held apparently in this room. And the societies, well, both together, they advocated for this directorate of colonial geological service, DCGS. A chap called Frank Dixie became the first director uh, once the whole thing was agreed, I think it was in 1948. And within a decade, there was a colonial survey almost in every part of the, the Commonwealth. Um, what is the Commonwealth today? And they lasted f until the 60s, so from the late 40s, early 50s into the 60s, when, of course, many of the countries became independent. But the countries just flipped the surveys and the surveys continued as national geological surveys. And many of the maps in our map room are from that time. And many of the documents here that we have are also from that time. And this is one from what was called Southern Nyasaland, which is today Malawi, uh, and from Frank Dixie. And Frank Dixie was, the, as I said, the, the boss of the, uh, uh, the first boss of the colonial survey and he was a geomorphologist and he was in this big debate about African topography and uh, was a great observer and his observations live on today. But that interest in resources was at a level but in the early 70s it suddenly went up an awful lot and it went up because of the invasion of Sinai and the Golan Heights by Egypt and, and Syria, and the ultimate Arab embargo of oil 
uh, into the Western world, into the Western markets, because they felt that uh, the US particularly was, uh, was supporting the, the Israeli uh, landowners as, as they were at the time. Um, that suddenly sent a massive shockwave through the world. This was the first time that oil had been weaponized in that way, weaponized as a political weapon. And there was a big hunt for alternatives. And the obvious alternatives were uranium. And most of these geological surveys were given money to look for uranium. Come 1976, I was leaving university. Um, I was uh, <coughs> restless and um, a bit itinerant. And uh, Ross Sutton down the road in Imperial College uh, helped me find a direction by going out to one of these surveys in Zambia. And um, those are the maps that I made at the time that I want to go to next. Now, for those of you who don't know where Zambia is, this is Southern Africa, uh, and Zambia sort of sits in here. It's a butterfly shape. And the area I mapped and was involved with was this, this northern bit here, and it's about that size. So almost on any map the size of, of Africa, you can see a sort of little square that, uh, that the map is what you're going to have a look at now. So the African map I'm going to show you is uh, a couple of degree sheets in northern Zambia, as, as I mentioned. Uh, and we'll go from the, the start. This, is oh, these two are field sheets that uh, show the, the working methodology. Um, these were constructed between 78 and 82. So the field technique was traversing perhaps one to two, three kilometers wide traverses uh, based on a search for outcrop. So usually along incised rivers or escarpments or hilltops. <clears throat> my insistence on hilltops was something my local colleagues at the time uh, never really understood or came to appreciate. And the same could be said for my uh, friend, colleague, supervisor, Mike Coward. He was, uh, became my PhD supervisor and a mentor for a long time. Um, and he visited me a couple of times here. And one evening, tired and uh, uh, staring into the campfire, he, he, he raised the somewhat rhetorical question that he couldn't understand why his students often found the most crucial outcrops on the top of steep hills and mountains, or at the furthest points away from roads. And in my case, we were probably two days walk away from the nearest road, and uh, we had done quite a high ridge that day. So. Um, and the purpose of the map mapping was, was multiple. Uh, for a new independent country like Zambia, they wanted to know about their resources. And so they were keen that this was done and they followed on from the colonial days, changed many things, uh, but uh, fundamentally the science approach, scientific approach survived and, and, and flourished. Um, from Britain's point of view, there was an interest because or the Western world even, let's say, because the Western world would decide uranium was the next big thing in energy. And they were looking for uranium. And the area, this area that uh, I'm showing you here had, a, had various uranium or uh, radiometric anomalies, the source of which were unsure. And thirdly, there was an academic reason. Belusov had been pushing plate tectonics in continents. Here we are in Africa, uh, in the middle of Africa, where there was a similar problem. And this is a map produced by Robert Shackleton in the, in the uh, first half of the 70s. And it shows this crisscrossing array of, of mobile belts uh, relating to a, a sort of central crater. And Robert wasn't advocating anything, I don't think, in this other than there's a problem. Is this as simple as it looks? Do we know? And that was the academic purpose behind this. Were these, this, this, these big belts of orogenesis somehow peculiar and different from alpine and collisional tectonics, or were they alpine and collisional tectonics in some way? And uh, beyond that, how far back in time could you extrapolate plate tectonic mechanisms? And uh, all the way through the Proterozoic, most of these rocks are meso to early Proterozoic, through to the Archean, 
and the very beginnings of, of our planet. A debate that still is valid today. So, uh, the technique, clearly you needed this prized thing, which was my mapping case, and has done walks many miles with me. Um, and here are some of the field sheets that these very quickly became drawn up on a weekend and uh, in, in lots of time to myself, camping in the bush here. And these were the maps that uh, sort of grew iteratively, incrementally, as I integrated all these, these observations that you can see here and built a story that became, from, for me, a PhD, but became part of the, the story of the uh, mesoproterozoic history of, of Zambia and its resources. The interest in resources was from aggregate to limestone for cement and, of course, base metals and even gold. And we, I guess we found bits of all that here, but none of which uh, res re resulted in a, in a great mine that I can claim. But that uh, basic fieldwork on 1 to 50,000 sheets, uh, which covered um, in, in here, uh, took me about six years in total. Um, were put together and published and they looked like this. So these were the finished product of what uh, that stuff I showed you there was, was about. And each one of these, degree, these quarter degree squares had four of the one to 50,000 sheets that made it up. That mapping was a pretty laborious task, uh, but the slow evolution of the ideas and the interpretation and the iteration that went on um, was a real pleasure as you learned about this piece of the earth's crust. Um, it was also usually adventurous. You know, there, was, there are people who live here but there are no roads east of a line that went up through like that. So this was all walking and 10 day and longer safaris in with people carrying food and, and what have you. And the map was put together, uh, and you knew you'd finished when you covered the ground. It was only as I did that, and I put the whole thing together, that I started to realize various things about this. As I was doing that, I was very fortunate. The survey gave me a sabbatical of a year to expand this work into the northwest of Zambia. That I did, and uh, that came up with something slightly more of a Carter schematic map, uh, which is here. And the area that you've seen in these four maps is this northern quarter up in here. Uh, so I then expanded and had a look south and a look northwest and tried to tie in some of the ideas that were emerging out of this to, to that. And of course, I drew cross sections. I haven't brought those today, uh, but this is a cartoon of them, of, of, the, of the summary of them. And one of the big things that I carry away from mapping is that when you end a map, you've just created a beginning. You know, the really exciting thing about ending a map is all the questions you're left with, not the beautiful map you have created. Because actually, this is just irritation. All the things I look at this and I know that I don't know are right and I feel the cartographer could have done a little better, the, uh, you know, or, or, and I could have done better. That's in the past. The, 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 the really inspiring thing is what comes next. And there were three things in this, in this work and the expanded work that really I carried around with me for uh, 30 years of being an oil explorer and executive and all that stuff, and um, got back to doing a little work on recently. And one of them was this. Well, let's go through three things. First of all, I have a, a diagram here, a section, and it shows um, cooling age against the, the cross section. And you can see that the cooling ages uh, show sort of quite a high variation, degree of variation around 1800 here, 1100 here, and then they fall down even lower down to about 600 there. So we're seeing three ages of resetting of, uh, of, of 
potassium argon systems in this, in this one section. And I had a pretty good idea about this first one, why that was happening, but I didn't understand why this was happening. And it's still, it's still a, a, a thing that we're thinking about with various mining companies. The second thing, and the thing that I took to BP with me and, and spent a lot of time wondering about late afterwards was, was this thing right at the end, tucked in at the end, you barely see it, but this is the edge of the rift. You can see the rift valley here, it's the Luangwa rift. It was supposedly a res res residual permatriassic rift valley, um, but clearly every time I crossed the boundary fault, as I pointed out in these maps uh, here, the boundary fault is hugely, hugely cross-cutting everything. And that was the norm. In, most, in all the mapping I did, actually, I would say that was the norm. This idea of reactivation alt fabrics was very difficult to sustain. And yet, as I expanded the view and expanded it to this regional sort of hundreds of kilometers view, there was compelling evidence that there was a relationship between the location of the Rift Valley and the location of the origin. And that sort of contradiction I thought was definitely interesting and, and actually uh, <laughs> still do and still puzzle about it. And finally, um, there's a big blob in the middle here. It's called here the Banguelu block. And that's easy, it's an it's a, uh, early Proterozoic craton. Uh, but on the surface, there's a huge wetland area a little smaller than the Okavango, but it's probably the second largest wetland area south of the Sahara. And why that should be there, perched on a plateau at 1,200 metres, was interesting to me. Um, as I left, as I sort of thought about it afterwards, not while I was worrying about the metamorphic geology of, of, of this, uh, this terrain. Uh, and what's come to light is that it's one of the, uh, it's a major source of methane. We were fortunate enough to fly over it recently in a, a NERC-sponsored uh, methane measuring aircraft. <laughs> Apologies, Moya. And uh, there is a massive plume of methane coming off this, uh, this wetland area here, which we've just published, uh, or just in the process of publishing about. So three things that appeared out of here that I uh, felt were as or more interesting after than, than the, uh, the basic mapping I did. Um, and to me, that's sort of a conclusion about mapping, that mapping is an essential start to everything, but it's never an end in itself. It just begins more questions. And that's research and that's exploration. And that's all I had to say. Thank you very much.